additional training that will assist. As you may know, Mr. Chairman, uh, we work very closely with our colleagues in Baltimore City across the board in various uh, law enforcement activities in our community. Uh, additionally, uh, we're, we're involved with meeting with various PTO organizations around our school community, talking about safety, talking about issues of concerns uh, in and around their communities as well as our school communities, and more importantly, uh, talk about traffic issues. This year, more than the six years that I've been in the school system, uh, traffic issues have become a number one concern around the northeast quarter of the city. Uh, so we're, we're really focusing in on traffic and working with the uh, Department of Transportation to address those concerns as well. Um, as I said, and uh, Councilman Scott asked a question about what are we doing educational-wise. I myself personally hold town hall meetings with students around our school district to talk about positive behavior and what law enforcement involvement and what that entails when dealing with young people. So I am addressing those issues in the school district. That's Thank you. Any questions from the... Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. Nice. Uh, at this time, we'd like to hear from Dr. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Mr. Alvin Yoyard, Director. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. This is the first time I've ever been in city council chambers and been elevated to the position of doctor, and I. <laughs> I appreciate all that warmth. Uh, the chairman did submit a few questions uh, for the Civilian Review Board and we'll respond briefly and certainly any questions that you may have, we're happy to respond. Since the existence of the Civilian Review Board, how many complaints are received annually? For the last four years, we've averaged between 125 to 130 complaints. Uh, within those complaints there, is an average of 150 to 180 allegations because each complaint can contain from one to five allegations. The categories of complaints that we accept from citizens are use of excessive force, abusive language, harassment, false arrest, and false imprisonment. There is no specific category of complaint for racial profiling, so we would not have any statistics on how many individuals felt that they were victims of racial profiling. Um, out of the complaints that we receive, on average, 40 to 55 percent of those allegations are for use of excessive force. 30 to 35 percent are um, allegations for abusive language, and the other categories of complaints make up the remainder. Um, generally, the board reaches a conclusion different from the Internal Affairs or in Internal Investigation Division in approximately 15 to 20 percent of the cases it reviews. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but the manner in which the board works is that the board has the option to conduct <coughs> its own simultaneous investigation at the same time that Internal uh, Investigations does its or the board can opt to wait until those investigations are completed and the board will just review their findings. The board can either sustain their findings, not sustain, exonerate, or uh, render it unfounded, or they can send it back for further investigation. Uh, we found over the years that the, the greatest challenge that the board faces beyond resources because that's always a challenge and, and we recognize that the board could do so much more if the resources were in place. But uh, in addition to the issue of resources, one of the greatest challenges that we face is that the department in its review use a, a, a burden or standard of clear and convincing the Civilian Review Board uses as its standards a preponderance of evidence. So oftentimes, we're not going to reach the same conclusion. I, I think uh, too often, folks think that the average citizen will routinely reach a different conclusion than that of the Internal Investigative Division of the Police Department. But that's not true. As I said, we generally find somewhere between 15 or 20 percent a different conclusion than, than internal investigations. But the reason that we do more times than not 
is because we're looking or using a different standard of proof. Uh, so I think that's a challenge that, that needs to be addressed. I have not had an opportunity, nor the board, to uh, sit down with the new commissioner, but in speaking with Jim Green, we're anxious to do that, and we know that the commissioner has had conversations with one of our members, Ms. Charlene Bourne from the Eastern District, and he's already indicated to her that he would be happy to meet with the board, and as a matter of fact, the difficulty has just been in scheduling. So we do anticipate that hopefully within the next 30 uh, days or at least two months, the uh, commissioner will be able to come in and meet with the board and some of those issues that we've historically found as challenging we'll be able to resolve. Uh, we firmly believe and we're convinced that we have a great opportunity now to work strategically with the Baltimore Police Department to, to really promote and to preserve the, the, the people's best interests. And, and that's going to be um, what we share with the commissioner and certainly the overtures that we've heard thus far is exactly what the commissioner would like to do as well. Chair recognize uh, Vice Chairman Brandon Scott. Mr. Gilliard, thank you so much for coming, sir. Thank you. Uh, just, just a quick question. I don't know if you know off the top of your head, but uh, if you could speak to the, your percentage of what cases, you know, if it's, a, it's excessive, excessive force or what have you, are the most sustained, which, which cases are you finding as the review board to sustain the most? Probably abusive language, language. Uh, be, be, because oftentimes that's the precursor to everything. Uh, folks feel that either the attitude or the language is insolent, and that generally leads to something else. And, and the board uh, certainly has a lesser degree of difficulty in sustaining those allegations more than anything else. And just, uh, you spoke about the, the difference in the parameters that you guys do, use to sustain cases in internal affairs. Have, do you have thoughts of how you guys can try to work to, with the police department to remedy that? Or I, I think this discussion and reach an agreement because initially when the board um, was enacted through the General Assembly and we met with the um, uh, police department at that time, it was concluded that the board would use the standard of preponderance of evidence and that the department would as well. But over the years, with changes in administration, the department moved to the clear and convincing standard and the board is still using the preponderance of evidence. So it's just a simple matter of coming together. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Mr. Gilliard, uh, Gilliard, I'd like to find out from the decisions that was upheld by the panel, your panel, and presented to the police department. How many of those presented to the police department uh, did they find in favor of what the board acknowledged and disciplined well, on those issues? Is there any way we can find that out from the... I, I, I'm not sure if the department, department would have those stats, but we make the recommendation uh, it's up to the commissioner to exact whatever the disciplinary action will be, whether the department has accepted the uh, findings of the board. Uh, I, I'm not sure what those statistics are. Is there any? Okay. Ms. Cum, who runs our IA section, I'm sorry, okay. we just weren't prepared to handle that line of questioning tonight. Is, is there any way that the you can submit those answers back to this body here because I think it's very important if the board sits down and they prepare these cases and they find they have findings, uh, we would certainly like to see all agencies working in conjunction with one another. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to, my opinion, doesn't make any sense. Yes, sir. We'll have uh, uh, Chief Williams prepare kind of a report to come back to you uh, through Jim Green. We'll have something that comes Thank back. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, last thing, uh, Mr. Chairman, we do uh, work with the local branch of the NAACP to produce this, what to do if you're stopped by the police department. And the police department certainly was a part of the initial group that came together to produce this. So if uh, any of you would need these to distribute to your constituency, we'd be happy to provide them for you. Thank you. Sir. Sure. Thank you. Certainly appreciate it. I'll share it with my constituents, definitely. Uh, at this time, we'd like to take
public testimony unless there's any questions by the panel that wish. Okay. Mr. Sonny Jones. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the uh, Public Safety Committee. Um, I want to say welcome to our new police commissioner, uh, to uh, the representatives of uh, the public school system, and also uh, any others who are gathered here in the chamber today. Um, I have a prepared statement, but I want to veer off from that for a moment and address uh, some of the testimony that I've heard. Um, I'm here uh, as a representative of John Q. Public. And uh, what we've heard in the chamber sounds wonderful, really sounds good. But if I'm an 18 to 25 year old black man with locks walking on Urban and Bel Air Road and I'm told by an officer to shut up pull my pants down, take off my shoes uh, for the simple fact that I was walking down the street and they do that under the quote auspices of reasonable suspicion. Now, I'm, I'm a Vietnam veteran, United States Marine, and I understand that if I'm an officer and I've been empowered with the duty to arrest, as the commissioner stated, I still carry those biases and prejudices with me whether I have that uniform on or not. So if I look at a person and I decide that I don't like the kind of shoes they're wearing, I don't like the fact that they have a bald head, I don't, I don't like the fact that they're female or that they're gay or that they're walking with their pants sagging, then it's not about me trying to uphold the law. It's about me trying to uh, assert my own biases upon the public. So, you know, for those who sit in this uh, sanitary room and discuss statistics, it doesn't mean anything to the young man who is made to sit down on the curb when it's raining. It doesn't mean anything to the, to the gentleman who was, or, or lady who was pulled over in her vehicle and told uh, uh, expletives shut the blank up. You don't ask me the questions. I ask you the questions. I was blessed with the opportunity to teach uh, uh, at the academy for the entire year of 2011. And over that time frame, it was uh, revealed to me that there was a culture that exists, existed wherein officers, helicopter pilots, detectives, sergeants, patrol officers, canine, I, I, I had the opportunity to meet them all there was a comfortable atmosphere whereby they felt that they could make statements about the uh, uh, citizenry that they're supposed to protect and serve that I found to be derogatory and uh, frankly dangerous. Uh, we've had several assaults and uh, several people who have lost their lives as a result of encounters with police officers. Um, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but I too have a program called Choices and Consequences that I teach to young people about how to deal with police officers when they're stopped in a vehicular situation, a pedestrian situation, or even at their front door. And uh, so I've been teaching that to students uh, and uh, others in, in a community environment. So let me get into my uh, prepared statement. Mr. Jones, did you bring copies for us? Did you bring copies of your testimony? I, I, have, I, can, I can give you copies, uh, Councilman. Um, I want to begin my statement with a quote from a man who most in this room would agree was instrumental in the civil rights movement and a most effective advocate for all those who are, are the unseen and the unheard in our society. He wrote, and I quote, cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expedience asked the question, is it politic? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But 
conscience ask the question, is it right? There comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, politic, or popular, but one must take that position simply because it's right. Now, that quote comes from the Honorable Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And I stand here before you today simply because I believe that a law to prohibit racial profiling is the right thing to do. When I uh, raised my five sons, I could tell them as many times as I wanted to, don't go into the refrigerator when I leave. Don't have a party. Don't do this. Don't do that. But if that instruction wasn't backed up by the understanding that I would pull my belt off and tear their hind parts off if they did what I told them not to do was what made it stick. And a law to prohibit racial, racial profiling, along with all the other efforts that these gentlemen are speaking about, is what we need in our community. We can't be uh, uh, omnipresent. And as much as the upper echelon of the police department uh, may indicate that they're going to change the culture and that they're going to do all these great things, that's in the future. Right now, tonight, somewhere in Baltimore City, a police officer has a young man somewhere with his pockets turned out or his pants pulled down or his shoes off. Somewhere in the city right now, a police officer has a young man uh, uh, sitting on the curb uh, with uh, his back against the crotch of another young man. These are things that I witness and have witnessed daily. Uh, so that's why I'm here. I don't wish to be um, seen as being uh, um, adverse to the things that these officers have spoken about. Uh, Deputy Skinner can tell you that when I taught that class in the, at, at the academy, one of the things that I said to those officers is that if you're breaking in a car, if you're breaking into somebody's home, if you're committing assault, if you're standing on the corner drinking a drink or smoking a joint, you need to have a shirt on that says I'm stupid and I want to go to jail. But if you're riding or walking down the street in the city of Baltimore, you have a fourth, fifth, and 14th amendment right to move about freely without being stopped. Again, uh, and, and uh, Deputy Skinner can attest to this, uh, I've had officers when I go around walking my dogs uh, that I approach and want to meet and introduce myself to and let them know who I am and how I can help them in the community. And I've had officers tell, do me like this. And, and I look at the officer and I say, well, uh, I beg your pardon, look. And I happened to have that officer that did that to me come into one of my seminars. So I went up to him and I did him the same way. Because you do that to an animal, cat, dog. He could, if he would have said, sir, I'm busy, not right now, or um, something more civil, then I could have understood that and I would have said, okay, officer, you have a blessed day and take care. But the attitude is that this guy with locks, because I don't always wear a suit, this guy with locks, nine times out of 10, he's a dope dealer, nine times out of 10, he's some sort of a criminal, and I ain't got time for him. Get away from me. So let me continue. Much has occurred since we were last together here in this chamber, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the United States of America has re-elected the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama, for an unprecedented second term. Uh, elections were held for the Senate and House here in Maryland. Same-sex marriage has been sanctioned by the electorate of our state. And our mayor has chosen and installed a new police commissioner. Uh, the Institute of the Black World, Global Exchange, and law enforcement against prohibition has completed a 25 city tour of Mexicans who came through America on a caravan 
for peace and justice. Myself and Mr. Owens Bay have been blessed to be in different uh, uh, parts of the media talking about such things as the quote unquote war on drugs, the school to prison pipeline, the decriminalization of small amounts of mar marijuana and other drugs, and the prohibition of, racial pro uh, uh, prohibition of racial profiling by law enforcement personnel. I'm joined here today by Major Franklin, Director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, Mr. Ronald M. Owens Bay, who, by the way, is singularly responsible for the recent granting of historical status to our beloved Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School here in East Baltimore. His name adorns a plaque that's located on the entrance of that building. Uh, I'm also uh, joined by uh, Ms. Chris Brown, whose son was tragically killed by an off-duty police officer. Mr. Chairman, as we move forward, I would respectfully request that we, may, we remain focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is a law to prohibit racial profiling by law enforcement that's modeled after Ben Cardin's Senate Bill 1670. The citizens of Baltimore don't want to hear about what we can't do. They want to hear about what we're willing to do to protect their civil and human rights. In this recent election cycle, we were inundated with all sorts of uh, flyers and phone canvassing and mailers and everything else that told us about the value of our votes and how vital they are to the process of democracy. We've been assured, quote, that Ben is our friend. We heard our honorable mayor state in radio and TV spots that she was raised by parents who taught her the value of fairness. She stated with reference to same-sex marriage, quote, it's only right that we treat all people with fairness, and stated emphatically, who could disagree with that? This same mayor wrote an executive order to create a hands-off policy for our Hispanic brothers and sisters, but no such edict for 68% of this city's population that happened to be black. This is unacceptable. Now let me be clear. Again, after teaching my Perceptions and Assumptions seminar at the Police Academy for the entire year of 2011, I know for a fact that there are many, many good police officers uh, in our police department. But it's that 1%, that 5%, that folks encounter on a daily basis that create an environment that does not lead to cooperation between law-abiding law citizens and good law enforcement officers. Now, I'd like to define those terms. Law-abiding citizens may very well run a red light. They may very well make a turn without putting their signal on. They may very well speed, <laughs> but they don't commit murder. They don't commit assault. They don't rob people. They don't rape people. And they have a right to walk and drive without a constant concern as a person of color of being pulled up by an officer that has an attitude. Part of the, what I teach the young people is just the same way as officers are taught to assess us. Do I look like I have a weapon? Am I sweating? Are my eyes dilated? Am I staggering? I teach them to assess the police officers in the same way. Is that officer nervous? Does he have or she have a hand on her weapon? Uh, Mr. Jones, does he address or she, the, the panel. Does he, address the panel. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I was just saying address, address the, the panel. panel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, these are my, my friends. Okay. <laughs> we, we are. We're we not, we friends. We understand that right. you're friends. We, we just want you to address right. the, the um, 
So I'm going to end like this. Uh, I was taught that uh, it's best to try to uh, come up with things that we can agree upon. And I have some points here that I think everybody in this room can agree upon. And I'm going to state them. Number one, we can all agree, I believe, that crime is a major issue in our city and in cities all over this great nation. We can agree on that. I think we can agree that any person or persons who participate in criminal activity should be pursued, caught, and if convicted, then punished to the fullest extent of the law. I believe also that we can agree that law-abiding citizens and good law enforcement officers want safe, vibrant communities that foster environments where businesses can provide growth and prosperity. And finally, I believe that we can agree that any obstacles that prevent cooperation between law-abiding citizens and good police officers should be addressed and resolved. We have here before us an opportunity to make that happen, not just with the uh, things that uh, the police department and others have stated as being their objectives. I hope that comes to pass. But in the meantime, and in between time, I think it's important that we focus on a law that has teeth, which could be modeled after Ben Cardin's 1670. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to say thank you for your staunch support and your efforts as it relates to me, one of your constituents in the 13th District. Well, thank you, Mr. Jones. I really mean that. And I also want to extend that to the rest of the folks on the Public Safety Committee who I've encountered from time to time. Thank you. And I look forward to uh, answering any questions that you may have. And I really appreciate you yeah. bringing this to light. Oh, uh, and lastly, um, I, I would like to, uh, for uh, Mr. Neil Franklin, Major Neil Franklin, Mr. Yeah. Owens Bay, and also uh, Ms. Chris Brown to have an opportunity to address okay. the, uh, the um, panel. As the Vice Chair asked, do you have any copies of the statement that you were tweeting I, from? I can make sure I get some copies okay. to you. And second of all, uh, let me get with uh, Avery Azenstock with legislative reference uh, and see where we could take this bill to, or help this bill to become law. He could guide me on the legal ramifications of it. Uh, if not, uh, and he suggested we may have to send a resolution to our uh, state legislators, then I will introduce that into the city council for you also. But what I hoping to do until we get to that point to where we can make it a bill, to be able to build a relationship with all these agencies where we can put a halt on it. I think it's, uh, I feel real good about this commissioner here. Mm -hmm. uh, he's only been here for about three to six months, uh, three to six weeks, and I've seen so much that he's done, how he's reached out. Uh, if you look at the news, you can hear some of the uh, the justice that he's bringing to the situ uh, citizens by making us aware uh, that he's not going to tolerate any bad officers. I think that's a very good approach. Well, I've, I've uh, uh, extended and met the uh, new commissioner this evening. And um, once this is over, I hope he and I can get together as well as the deputy commissioner and talk about what we can do in the police academy. I offer my services to him. Because once again, and this is something that I've uh, said that, uh, and I hate to keep pointing you out, Deputy, but you know me, so that's why I'm doing this. Uh, my, my thing is this. We are not enemies on each side of this blue line. We're not enemies. And the closer we get to a level of cooperation, then that narrows the space in which the true criminals can operate. And if Criminals know that I have uh, an association and a rapport with the police department, and the police department reciprocates that. Then when they see me, they see him. When they see him, they see me. And that leads to the kind of environment where uh, community members who are law-abiding citizens are more than willing to work with and cooperate 
with the police department in order so that my grandmother or my mother-in-law can walk to the Northeast Market without fear of being um, robbed or whatever. So uh, I hope he'll accept that uh, invitation and give me the opportunity to meet with him. Uh, if you stand fast, uh, Vice Chair, Chairman Scott would uh, like to ask yeah. a question. Just one question for you, Mr. Sonny. I mean, I know the answer to it, but I have to ask you anyway. Okay. Uh, um, your program, do you think there's a way where you could take your, for what you do for young, young people and try to work, especially, I'm thinking, middle school ages and working with the middle school, the middle school boys, because I think that would be something that, that would be very beneficial to them. Excellent point, Councilman. And um, I'm hoping for the opportunity to meet with uh, uh, CEO Alonzo and or his representative and uh, talk about this dual approach program. Uh, as you know, um, when uh, Catherine Pugh, Senator Catherine Pugh was running for mayor, uh, she looked at my program and she had said that if she was successful in her run, that I would be the person who would be the liaison to teach this in the public schools as well as in the uh, police academy. So I stand ready to do that. Yes, uh, I've been doing it since 1980. It's no use in stopping now, yes, you know. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Kim Truhart. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Thank you for holding this reconvened hearing. I was here in July. Uh, I thought uh, it was the beginning of a very great conversation that was definitely long overdue. I thank Mr. Jones for bringing this um, to your attention. Um, I'd like to go back to some things that were discussed on the um, previous hearing on the 11th of July. Um, specifically, there was some f discussion about some forms that the police department currently has and are not often being used when they stop citizens. And those forms, we were told at that la last hearing, um, were something that they would try to reinvigorate in terms of um, handing those to citizens as they were stopped in vehicles or whether it was a pedestrian stop. And um, I'm not really They're sure. Called citizen I, contact forms. Right, citizen exactly. And, and so I did not hear any conversation about that this evening um, because uh, one of the things that was discussed the last time, they would come back to night and present us some, some additional data. Um, we also talked about um, the Senate Bill 14, um, wherein it required over a nine-year period for the department to report data, make it publicly available. Um, and they voluntarily, and I commend them for that, continued to do that reporting. And I want to make sure that it will remain so under the new leadership of our um, new commissioner and, and welcome commissioner again to my hometown. Um, so, so I'm very interested in the data, okay? And the other thing, um, there was a discussion about some handouts this evening, um, and I'd like to make sure that I can get a copy of those handouts. I would, I would appreciate if they were posted online. Um, in the bill it, file. it would have been very helpful to have those in advance for this conversation. Um, in terms of what I heard this evening, um, the fair and impartial policing policy. Um, I, I really like to hear more details about that. So if you have the handout, um, that would be very helpful. Um, I agree that biases uh, impact our decision making. And it is good to hear that our commissioner um, is looking at the academic world to help him um, in terms of human behavior, um, workforce development and training, all of those things are very important. Um, we, we need to, in my background um, in the intelligence world with the Navy, um, was very structured, okay? And so, so I don't understand an organization that's not disciplined, not at all, 
Okay, so, so when I hear that we have rogue cops walking around who are doing harm to citizens of Baltimore, that's a leadership problem, okay? So, so I look to the leadership of the organization as the problem in terms of why their employees are behaving badly, okay? So, so, so I, I hear a little bit of conversation about leadership development Okay, but I'm not hearing enough, okay? Um, and, and I'm not hearing enough about how we're gonna weed out the bad apples. Because they're bad apples. Everybody's acknowledged, you know, we, we hear 1% from our president, we hear 10% from the commissioner. Whatever that number is, they gotta go, okay? They do not need to be employed by Baltimore City. So, so I need to hear what is the strategy, working with the unions, because there cannot be any barriers to getting rid of bad apples, okay? If they're, if, they're, if they're rotten, you throw them out, okay? So whatever we need to do, and I'm not sure that there is a representative from our fraternal order of police here this evening, no, but they need to be here, because they need to be part of this conversation in terms of, of, of building a world-class police department in Baltimore City, which can be done. Okay, it's not an impossibility, okay? We, we got some great people working in the police department, but we got some bad apples and they need to go, okay? In terms of a taxpayer being here this evening, um, I heard some potential for some great collaborative work to occur. Okay, and, and, and I haven't seen the exchanging of business cards and phone numbers, but I'm sure that's going to occur. Cause, we're all in the same system. All right, great. Right, we're all, we're uh, right. So, so, but, but, but that ain't happening yet. Okay, so, so I'm looking for this evening to be the impetus for folks to start collaborating and working together. Okay, because it makes absolutely no sense that the, the members of the Family League of Baltimore City are not here this evening to talk about their efforts to reduce the disproportionate contact of juveniles with the justice system, the criminal justice system, okay? Because that has a bearing on what the police department does or does not do. Because if, if on one hand I'm spending my tax dollars to reduce the contact that our young people are having with the police department, and then on the other hand I'm spending money for him to lock more of them up, Something ain't right here. So, so why is one hand not working with the other hand? So, so I ask you to ask our police commissioner to go look at that study that says we have been introducing our young people disproportionately to the criminal justice system and there are alternatives and we need his help, okay? We desperately need his help. So, so the reduction should be very evident. Um, in terms of data, I love data, okay? So, so I heard our um, civil rights folks talk about the, the Civilian Review Board, okay? I don't know where their data is, but we need to see it. We need to see it regularly. It needs to be reported publicly. Um, I think that's critical in terms of visibility and transparency into what is occurring. Um, I, I'm not sure why the Civilian Review Board doesn't have regular meetings with the police department, but I'm sure that's gonna be put on somebody's agenda here real soon, and there will be regular exchange of ideas and, and conversation. Um, in terms of what I heard the, the commissioner talk about, um, he, he said that he had a problem inputting the data into some place. I'm not sure what that place was, where, where that, that, that puka, where this data about um, officer discretion and authority and the human biases of his impartial policing strategy, where, where does that data go? And how do I get to see that data? And, and, and if he really is reaching out to the academic community in Baltimore, which he, he acknowledges, and we all acknowledge is, 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 is a very vast community that is very capable of helping, um, I think I encourage that. I also attended earlier today.